Good morning. Good morning. Um, as Mrs. Hasselman has put it, let me start off with one thing. I'm not a protocol man. I'm not a protocol person. So no protocol. We are colleagues. We share. Um, and most of you would have experienced or come across the topics that we are going to discuss in your career, particularly when you are presiding officers. Now, I've looked at the program, um, and the, ti the time is quite tight. So what I've decided is I'm not going to stand and lecture and talk. We are going to interact. Um, I'm, I'm dealing with three topics. Um, the first topic is recusal and disclosure. Now, and then in that topic, we'll be dealing with what is required of a judicial officer. And the other topic that I'm going to look at is the topic of um, civil contempt. There are very few jobs where you walk in and you are required to take an oath. Very, very few. The only jobs I know, one is the president of the country, the legislatures, and the judiciary. Where you go, you take an oath before you assume your job. The others, once you pass the interview, you get the letter of appointment, you start doing. Now, why do you think we had to take an oath as judicial officers when we got appointed? Now, most of us, we have lived through the pre-constitutional era. We all know it was the supremacy of the legislature and the dictatorship of the executive. Now, with 1990, with the independence, we adopted a document called the Constitution, which that Constitution says our country, we have adopted to ourselves a country, which is a country that will, will, will be governed by the rule of law. And the Constitution, by, we will rule by law, not by the whims of a president, not by the supremacy of a constitution, but by the rule of law. And the supreme law of the country will be the constitution. That's the supreme law. And that's a document to which we'll keep on always reverting. Now, that document has a chapter called the, um, chapter three, and it deals with the fundamental rights and freedoms of not only citizen, but whoever finds themselves in Namibia. Now, in Article 12, sub-Article 1, paragraph A, the Constitution, among other things, reads as follows. In the determination of their civil rights and obligation, or any criminal charges against them, all persons shall be entitled to a fair and public hearing by an independent and impartial and competent court or tribunal established by law. Now, remember, the Constitution guarantees every person who has a dispute, be it civil or criminal, the Constitution guarantees the adjudication of that dispute by an independent and an impartial court. Now, it's for that reason that when you take the oath of office, you must swear that you'll carry out what the Constitution demands and requires of you. Now, I, I was surprised. You, you'll find some of these things. You ask yourself why, but it's unbelievable. You know, I've grown up in a, in a religious house. For those of us who believe, they, I, I know, we, I, I, we know. When you read the Bible, the Bible tells of a lot of issues that we take for granted, but they leave themselves out. Now, when I take an article like Article 12, 
Um, who, who's the disciple that sold Jesus Christ for 30 coins of silver? It's Judas. Now, the Bible already tells us that the silver coin, the silver coin can move heads and can change. I don't know how many of you have experienced it. I got appointed for the first time as an acting judge in June 2010. In June 2010. In August 2010, I had no less than three visitors who have visited me. No less than three. And everybody promising early Christmas for you if you decide this way or that way. I, I once I sat down with one of the visitors and I said to them, okay, let's take it. Give the brown envelope that you want to give me. Now, your opponent comes with a bigger envelope, a bigger brown envelope. And I have to decide in their favor. What will you think? No, it's unfair. No, if it's unfair against him, why should I accede to you? Now, and I said to him, I took an oath. And I'll live to that oath. So this is the importance of some of these things. Yes, it's you and the oath that you took. Nobody will be there when you get the brown envelope. It's true. But are you living to what a lot of other people sacrificed their lives for, gave their life for, gave their whole eternity for? And that it's a fair society. So that's just the introductory part. Now, Article 82, as I have said, um, Article 12 guarantees citizens and persons who find themselves in Namibia and who have disputes, to have those disputes adjudicated by an impartial and an impartial. Remember, I'm not using the word neutral. I'm using the word impartial. Impartial and an independent court. That includes you, it includes me. Article 82 therefore requires a person who's appointed as a judge to take the oath. Now, what do we regard when, when, when we say I'm impartial and I'm independent? There must be two, two integral aspects of that impartiality and the independent. What are they? One of the ingredients for you to be impartial, it requires you to have and to possess a sense of integrity. That's a first requirement. What the one of those ingredients? What is what will the second one be? Honest. Honesty. Integrity and honesty are ingredients and requirements for anybody who occupies and holds a judicial office. What do we mean by by, by integrity? It's it, it, it your internal trade, your own conscience. Now, what I'm going to do or going to say in private is what I must say when I'm in this room. That, that, that's the integrity part, the honesty part of it that a person must have. And those are the traits that are required for you to be able to be impartial and to be independent. Because if you have a falsehood within yourself, You know, 
I, in, in the last lecture when I had it, I said one, one issue that has been bothering me quite a lot is when I was in practice, I would be moving the breadth and length of this country. I'll have a case in Karasba. And just the following day, I have to appear in Oshakati. Now, you, and at that point in time, I had the belief. I don't know a false belief for that matter. The Swedish had, you see, prior to 1990, there were so many sanctions, we didn't have some of these cars. So we were made to believe that the Volvo was the safest and best car. So I'll, do, I'll get onto that Volvo, do 200 kilometers an hour from Karas to Venduk, and then, you see, now, I'm just taking a very simple thing. Can I do that today as a judge? Can I do? Why can't I do? Why can't I get into Mecca? I'm alone. I'm driving 200,000 kilos an hour. You see, why, why I'm saying it? I took that simple example. When you do 200 kilometers an hour, what do you do? Apart from doing wrong, you are endangering the lives of others. And what, what is, 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 that, is, is that an honor and truthfulness? That I, when I endanger the, I'm saying I'm protecting, I'm, I'm an administrator of justice and fairness. But at the same time, I'm putting the lives of others at risk. Isn't that being hypocritical? It's just some of those issues. Now, so all that I'm trying to do is say the whole concept of integrity starts with self-introspection. Whether anybody sees you, whether anybody says it or not, it's doing what we perceive as correct. Bottom line. And those are the, the traits and the requirements, and the traits and ingredients that we as judicial officers must attempt to live out. As I'm saying, we have all been judicial officers, most of us here. We are all judicial officers. It doesn't matter whether you are a Supreme Court judge, a High Court judge, a regional magistrate, divisional magistrate, or a district magistrate. You resolve disputes for people. And the same trait must live throughout for all of us. It doesn't matter. The same requirements and the same treats must live through all of us. And as I have said, it's the impartiality and integrity. Sorry, no, not impartiality and integrity, integrity and honesty. Yes. Now, Our society, integrity, it at times depends, we say, on the cultural beliefs. Hey, this is a difficult one that I normally say. Jacob Zuma. He has four wives. And apart from having four wives, you go and take on somebody and then you go to a shower. No, no, you, you're laughing. We will experience some of these issues. Now, especially some of those of us, um, they say we are of the weaker sex, the men. It, 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 it goes to the question of integrity. Intimate relationships, do they impact on integrity or not? How? You see, because, you know, I've been reading quite a lot of articles. And everybody always, on intimate relationships, they come down to the conclusion that if it's two consenting adults, then there's nothing wrong. Is that correct? 
Now, we are saying, in view of the cultural diversity and the constant evolution in moral values, the standards applying to a judge's private life cannot be laid down too precisely. This is particularly evident in respect of sexual activity. Now, OK, well, Charlotte has taken the, the example of, a, of the kudu. I take a very, there's one example that hurts me so much. I take, and it's a very simple example, and, and I take it. Let's assume I'm a teacher. Eh? Even at, let, I'll take it, for example, at, at the university. I'm a teacher. Charlotte is above 21 years of age. She, she'll be a consenting adult. I'm a teacher. I engage in a relationship with Charlotte. She's a consenting adult. Am I correct? She's a consenting adult. But how, what does that tell of my integrity as a person? I'll, I'll say this for one reason. And this, notwithstanding the fact that Charlotte is an adult like I am, I'm in a position of authority and superiority, whether we like it or not. So her whole decisions are not really informed by her individual choices and likeness, by, by what she can. So, and I am taking advantage of that simple position. So when a judge starts a relationship with a stenographer, or, or a secretary. What integrity does that person possess? Or even a magistrate? You understand? If we had known each other before, but when it becomes to that level, and particularly when you as a judge are already married, that's even worse. So although the moral Values. Society has changed so much. But some of these issues must lead us to self-introspection. My presentation comes from, I'm, I'm coming from one ankle. And the ankle is self-introspection. As I'm saying, it will take, it will take most likely Jesus Christ to convince me that a person over whom I have influence will be able to exercise their free will. It, it, will, take, it will take Jesus Christ to... to you see, if, if I'll rather resign and start and come back than start a relationship with a person who's under your authority. As I'm saying, because of the moral, it, there's nothing wrong. But imagine for a minute, you are taking advantage of something else. What honesty is there in? So, it will, so whether I, it's the same person who sees. You, see, you know, I, 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 I take this, when I was in practice as an example, I used to drive an Avanza. Most of my colleagues were saying, Yane, that car we use it as a, as a, as a bread <laughs> delivery vehicle for. <laughs> no, it's true. And, but I'll say, it doesn't matter. For me, it has a purpose. Now, but you see, somebody else can see, oh, OK, this guy may be in need of a BMW. So, and I'm in a position to offer him a BMW so that he can take decisions in my favor. What is different from that perspective and me? Oh, she, she, she worships me as a judge. I can take that advantage and get her for myself. What is the difference between those two issues? That, that, that's all that I'm trying to convey. And we, you need to debate. Whatever. And remember, you are put to a bigger scrutiny. But what is important is more yourself. I, do I have the integrity and the honesty that is required of me to have this position? That, that, that's the bottom line. 
No, no, you see what? All, all that I'm trying to say. Ni but 90%, you see, Velikoshi, if you are married, for example, what really in love is there? If you are married, what really in love is there? No, you are married, you have your partner. What really in love is there? No, apart from sitting, you understand? You are busy deceiving somebody. And you are busy abusing and making use of somebody else. What honesty and integrity is there? No, no, remember I said, I, I brought in the aspect of a marriage, when you are married, yes, and you do this to people, what, what really in love is there? That's why I'm asking the question. Yes. <laughs> then you first fall out of love and destroy that love that you have, and you, yes. But you see, what I'm trying to say is, is to live a deceitful life. Here you tell us and yourself, you care for somebody. But in reality, you are lying to yourself. You have somebody else that you care for. So the best is tell the person you are with, you get out of your way, and then you start your own issue. All that I'm trying to say, I'm not saying you can't fall in love, but all that I'm trying to point and to put forward is the deceit that is involved in some of these, as of these issues that we are dealing with. So I'm trying to demonstrate the degree of integrity and honesty. And one thing that integrity, honesty, and impartiality requires is for you to disabuse yourself of taking into account and into consideration some of the issues that will influence you to arrive at a given decision. That's why I'm saying I am not surprised, particularly at your level, at our level, be it the high court, you get up. Anybody who says they don't get approached, I wonder whether they are honest. I have sat down and say, what is it that I did in those three cases? I had three, I had options. You either take the money, Keep quiet, but again, what I'm saying is, what is it that you are doing to yourself? Two, you report the person, because that is to the police, because that's bribery and corruption. But I said, no, I'm not going to report. Not because I don't want to, but I'm going to educate this guy. You see? All, because all that I'm saying is, it's okay, give me your brown envelope. I'll ask the other guy to give me a bigger brown envelope. Simple as that. And then I take a decision in their favor because they have given me a bigger brown envelope. How fair is it? How do you like that? No, it's unfair. Now, when it's against you, it's unfair. But when it's against another person, it's fair. So if it's unfair towards you, it's unfair towards the other person. And I have taken the oath to be fair and just between the two of you. And I'll keep to If I hadn't taken the oath, it's a different ball game altogether. But I've taken the oath. It took me two years to decide whether to accept the position of a judge or not. Two years. For a simple reason. You are faced with quite a lot of issues. You want to go into business. You want to enjoy your life. No, it, it's true. Especially where, you know, I, I, I am going to say one thing. Especially when, you know, when I, I was a teacher for 15 years. And all the beautiful faces. And I was a single man. You have to see all these beautiful faces that go through you. No, it's, it's true. You know, you are a lawyer. You see all these clients that come to you. And you see all the ways how to manipulate and to get to riches easily and fast. You get exposed to all those things. 
But then, what, what, is, what is in you? You must be a strong person. We're all born with some of these weaknesses and qualities. But what matters is how you, as a person in yourself, you want to define yourself, you want to live out what you are. And remember, please just remember as judicial officer, for you to be a judicial officer, who will be in the position to be able to administer justice and fairness, you require that integrity and honesty within you. It's paramount. Without that, forget about administering justice without fear or fail. It, it, it must, I must say, it, you see, it must be a challenge. And the whole concept of integrity and honesty transcends all aspects of life. I'll, I'll, I'll take a simple example. As I, I, take, I make this as a joke. You know, we were born in a historical period of life where how people treat you and how people deal with you is not simply because they don't look at you, but the skin of your color will determine how you are treated, right? That's historically. Now comes, you are appointed as a judge. Now, do I sit, now come and sit as a, now it's my time to take revenge on all the white people for what they have been doing. You see, it's, it's, it's also again a question of, yes, do I treat white lawyers different from black lawyers? Do I disrespect? There are those, some of those cultures where women are nothing. They'll, they'll even tell you a woman is not a human being. It's a subordinate of a man. Do I discriminate against women, lawyers, as against male legal practitioners? Those are the issues that you deal with. So now, as a, head, as a head of the institution, that is required to do. Some of these issues will not come to you, but once they are revealed and they are brought to you, you need to address them with the individual person who's involved in some of the practices. For example, if as, as a judge president, you have a judge who has a habit of starting relationship with the, secret with the secretaries, or with stenographers, or with research assistants. You need to call him in and talk to him. Because this issue impacts not only on him, but on the whole institution as a judiciary. So if you don't address it with them, then you are, as a leader, you are also living a false life. Hard as they may be. They need to be approached, they need to be confronted, and they need to be discussed. You can't just leave them and look at them. Yes, currently, you, you, you do find legal practitioners that were accusing judges. You see, that these are some of the issues that actually undermine the whole issue of the judiciary. Racism can undermine the judiciary, totally. It can, and it will. And when I'm a racist, am I living true? Am I exercising that integrity and the honesty? I am not. I am not. Now, having discussed the whole qualities and that of to be able to deliver justice impartially and independently. Let's look at our conduct in court. When, when we are in court, what is expected of us? One thing that I have, my experience, is simple. Every situation, 
I, I, have, I have not come for the, I've been on the bench for the past, it's actually five years, but with the acting period, I'll take seven. I have not come once across a scenario that has a reason in court, and there is no legal principle that governs that situation. I haven't. Be it procedural or substantive, there is always a legal principle that governs a given situation. You know, and even now, a lot of lawyers, judge if you want to. Judge if you want to. It's not what I want. Because if it's what I want, come to my house. <laughs> and then I deal with you in the way I want, what I want. No, it's true. When I'm there, what is it that the law says? Full stop. Tell me the law says this, and I do X. But if you tell me what I want, it's not what I want. It's what the law requires. So in court, all that I'm saying is when you're in court, you deal with the people who are appearing before you whether it be a litigant or a party, in accordance with the rules and the conduct that portrays fairness and impartiality. Can I ask, your personal knowledge and the upbringing, will it influence you in, on how you handle a given situation? You know why I'm asking this question? Um, I did my Lorraine, I did my training at the University of Zimbabwe. I did one year. Um, we, at that time when I was at UZ, we, have, we had a, what we call a legal aid clinic where in your fourth year, will be attached to. There was a legal practitioner who will always say to us, you, saw, you know what, before you appear, he'll tell us, go and study this judge. Is he religious? Does he have a liberation struggle credential before him? Does he believe in God? He studies the judge. He studies the judge. And once he has known the judge, he tries to put, you know, so, so if you are religious, he plays on your religious emotion. No, it's true. If he knows that you are religious, he plays on your religious emotions. If you were a capitalist, he will advance the capitalist. At that time, the issue of socialism, capitalism in Zim was quite strong. All those aspects, he'll study them. Now, as a judge, you must be very, very careful of how much you give away of your own beliefs, your upbringing. But to an extent, at times it helps. Why do I say at times it helps? I had a case, um, I'll, I'll, it, because it's a, it's a case, it's a public case, um, I'll mention the names. Advocate Stradom appeared on behalf, it, it, was, it was a divorce matter. It was a divorce matter. Advocate Stradom appeared. Now, this guy comes to court and the, hus the wife was complaining about um, violence. The guy says, no, I love my wife. That's why I was beating him. No, I love my wife. That's why I was beating him. Advocate Stradom came and argued vehemently that it's totally impossible that you hurt a person you love. It can't be. I said, no. Because you haven't experienced it, doesn't mean. I said to him, uh, Advocate Stradom, I'll give you an example. With you, white boys, I said that in court. No, it's true, it, and it's a truth. When you are in love, for example, with a girl, you go to the shop, you buy roses, you go and give the girl. That's a sign of 
telling you why that you laughing. With us, we didn't have those luxuries. You will wait for this girl to be sent to the shop by the father or mother. And when she comes from the shop, you run behind the grab her on the arm and twist her a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. Those are the different, you understand? I'm, I'm, the twist hurts, but I'm hurting you not necessarily with a bad intention to hurt you, but to convey my feelings for you. That's my experience. But the fact I was doing it doesn't mean that I had bad intention. All that one needs to say that, you see, that may be your way of bringing it up, but no, that's not the way of how you communicate your love to your, to your loved one. But to condemn is, is unacceptable and false. It's also not correct. And you'll find, you see, when you are sitting as a judicial officer, you'll find issues that are presented to you of which you have no experience. But because you have no experience, you cannot just condemn it as false or untruth. So th those are the realities of life. But when you sit there, one issue that you do not do is you do not descend into the whole arena and get muddied by that mud of the two people firefighting. You try to keep as aloof as possible. As I say, um, you know, most of the colleagues here, you know, even when I was teaching admin law, I'll not go through my, I'll give you a question and I'll say, go and prepare, we come and discuss. Now, what we are saying is, In terms of the Constitution, people have got, they have been guaranteed by the Constitution that their disputes will be adjudicated by a body presided over by persons who are impartial and independent. Right? Now, what happens when? your brother comes before you. Exactly. Now, alongside the principle that you must sit and decide cases impartially and independently, also comes the case where there is an interest, you have to recuse yourself. Now, before I go on to discuss the whole topic of recusal, assuming this is what has happened in a magistrate's court. Let's assume now you are a judge, an appeal is lodged, and one of the grounds of appeal is that this magistrate shouldn't have presided over this matter. I'm going to give you a hint. It's not about the absence of the lawyer. So. Simansuku says he will uphold the appeal. You have been assigned to preside over a matter in which the accused person is a white policeman who is alleged to have killed a young black man while he was in custody in police cells in the pre-independence era, that is during 1989. You are a black judge and your son was killed by a white police officer while in the custody of white police officers. The parties are not aware of this. What will you do? Yes. No, you, are, you see, you have a son. Your son was killed in 1989, was being held by white police officers in jail. Now here comes a white police officer who is charged with killing a black young man while they are holding him in police cells. But all the parties don't know. No, you had a child. Your child was killed in 1989. Now we are in 2017. In 1989, your child was killed by white police officers while he was in prison. Now here comes a white police officer. He's charged with murder 
of killing a black boy once he is in prison. Now in independence, it will happen. It happens. Well, but the parties don't know that you had a child, and they allow you to proceed at the beginning of the trial. It's not your child. Yeah, okay. Yes, it's not your child. Yeah. What I'm saying is, we are in 2017. Yes. In 1989, that's about 18 years ago, your own child, you know, because there were school boycotts, throwing stones, your child got arrested in this milieu of, 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 of school boycotts. He was then detained. In the process of detention, he was tortured by these white guys, and he died. He was killed in police cells. Now, here comes today a black young boy. He's arrested, and he dies in police custody. Now, the white police officer comes before you. You must try him for murder. And the parties don't know that you have a personal experience of a young man dying in, in police custody. Pardon? You would? I would deal with it. Yeah. This is, uh, uh, it has no direct uh, impact on me. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's something that I can take advantage of without the knowledge of the parties. Because even if I'm emotional and I'm dealing with my child's death and the circumstances under which my child was killed are similar to the ones that are presented before me, mm. of course there'll be that emotional, there might be that emotional attachment to the manner in which I'm going to deal with the matter. But nobody really exactly which side I'm at. And you could actually get away with it. Uh, to be quite honest, as a human, you could actually get away with trying to fix certain people uh, mm. using your authority and position in this regard. Okay. So that's where the integrity and order issues that we're discussing yeah. will come through. Where the dispassionate uh, things that we're discussing will come through. But truth of the matter is where you're coming from also has an impact on the decision that you're making. Okay. Keep that in mind. Uh, I'll go to I, Simpson. As a presiding officer, I know that I must be impartial. Mm -hmm. I must not be prejudiced. Mm -hmm. I must not be um, favored. Mm -hmm. favor. mm -hmm. So I, I ask myself, am I emotionally ready mm -hmm. to cope with this? Mm -hmm. Will I be able to make a fair decision? And if the answer is in the positive, then I proceed. But if there's some doubt whether I can or cannot and I say, no, I'm okay. Keep that in mind. All these discussions that you are having and the opinions, keep them in mind. We'll come back. May uh, Nelly, may Klassen, and then Sorita. Judge, I look at this and in my view, black or white, mm -hmm. for me, it shouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. Whatever happened in the past, we are all affected by it, unfortunately, whether we like it or not. But the bottom line is, I have subjected myself to uphold the Constitution. So yeah. whatever cases today that come before me, I deal with them as such. Because at the end of the day, the person is killed. What does the law require <coughs> of me to do as a judge? I don't look at color. I need to look at what has happened and deal with it in accordance with that. It shouldn't really impact me, whether it's a white policeman killing a black child or a black policeman killing a white. It should not be. At the end of the day, the person is dead. There's a case that I, as a presiding officer, need to deal with in accordance with the law, and that's how I would deal with it. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm with Mr. Simpson on this. Um, that Yes, Nelly, we agree. We, in principle, we know all these things, but at the end of the day, we're also human beings. And for me, um, you should ask, it's about the introspection thing. Ask mm. yourself whether uh, it is still, whether you are able to separate yourself emotionally. And uh, the, the, what I would have done if I was in this, uh, if I was presiding, I would have informed the parties. For me, they should know. Because it, it wouldn't be proper for them to find out afterwards. I would have probably informed them and said, this happened, um, address me on that. Also, just so that uh, it's not just for me. Sorry, you know, yeah, my, my class, and sorry, sorry, sorry. What did you say? What would you do? I'm sorry, I missed that. You invite the parties uh, you okay. know, on, on addressing me on possible recusal 
or not. If okay. they are comfortable, will they perceive justice to, 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 be, to be brought at the end of the day? Okay. Keep that in mind. I'm not going to say anything now. <laughs> Surita? Remember, as a judge, you have only one person you are answerable to. When you, in, the, in the performance of your judicial duty, even as magistrate, yes. not only as judge, you only have one person you are answerable to, the law and the constitution. I have nobody else to explain to why I, as a judicial officer, the, the chief justice, the judge president can ask me why, the chief magistrate, nobody can ask. You can only answer to the law and to the constitution. Is your decision in accordance with the law? Is it constitutional? Bottom line. Yeah. Yes, I, I agree. Uh, yeah. For the reason, uh, my uh, my comment is just as much as also be seen to be done. And in this case scenario, um, the public might not see it that justice is seen to be done because you kept that to yourself and you did not disclose it. Keep that in mind, Charlotte and Asino. And then we do the last one before we go out for lunch. Yes. And then after lunch, we'll come and take up the discussion. Yes. But for me, I just want to add that if I was faced with this, I would tell the JP that knowing what happened, I need Why to the JP? You, you because <laughs> oh, the register of whoever signs the case, because I would, I would advise him that I don't think I'm ready, okay, depending on how yes. far the hearing has come, of course, mm. whether I've gone to counseling, whatever, and then say, okay, no, I think I've made peace, I can proceed, or no, I have not, and then give it to someone else. Okay. Yeah. May I see no? Well, she answered no. That's what I wanted to say. Okay. If you're emotionally ready, it depends from a judge to a judge. Maybe you are still mourning the loss of your child. Mm. Maybe I've gone through counseling and I believe in the Bible, forgiveness and everything, so that it will not way of an impact on my Okay. Yeah, just to follow on what uh, Sam also said, um, what will the public, recusal is not only a subjective thing, <coughs> it's in the eyes of the public, mm -hmm. what would they see? It, it, you are a magistrate, mm -hmm. you are with a prosecutor, you drive with, you drive with this prosecutor in the same car, you get to the, you see, especially those of us who do out of town periodic courts. You come from Mariendal to on the way to Gojas. You are with the magistrate and the prosecutor in one car. You are booked in the same guest house. You drive together and you come and preside over the cases. What, what, what is your view? For me, um there is that presumption of integrity. Mm -hmm. but, so driving in the same car and what does not mean that you'll be biased, perhaps in the eyes of but the remember, accused, but... Mm -hmm. Remember the whole court when he's driving in that car. The, the lawyers. Mm -hmm. Preference and lawyers. What? <laughs> the lawyers with the, with the magistrate in the same car. Sorry, sorry. Eh? So, so the lawyer also. Yes. 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 No, it can't be. It happens. It happens. Sure. All right, let's go for lunch. <laughs> <laughs>